Hi, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Dr. David Marks. Up to 4 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease. And believe it or not, it's the fourth leading cause of death in this country. But what is Alzheimer's disease? Who does it affect, and how do you diagnose it? Joining me to talk about these issues are two experts. First, we have Dr. Norman Relkin. He's director of the Cornell Memory Disorders Program at the Weill Cornell Medical College. Welcome. Hi, David. And also we have Dr. Peter Davies, the Resnick Professor of Alzheimer's Disease Research at Albert Einstein School of Medicine. Welcome. Okay. Norm, let's start off by talking about what Alzheimer's disease is. Well, Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of dementia in the elderly. Uh, dementia being defined as a decline from a previously attained state of cognitive uh, accomplishment uh, that's sufficiently severe to interfere with daily life. Dementia also has to be progressive, and Alzheimer's disease is slowly progressive, often over about a decade. Is how widespread is this problem? All over the Western world, um, the disease appears to have about the same incidence. So we, we would see perhaps 6 or 7% of the over 65s affected, uh, and that number may be as high as 30, 40% of the over 85s. You know, very, very large consumer of healthcare dollars, of course. My impression is that we've heard a lot more about Alzheimer's over the last decade or two. Is that because the population is aging? Oh, most definitely. The, the turn of the century, life expectancy was only about 60. Um, and of course, Alzheimer's disease happily is very rare prior to age 60. Now, how did it get the name Alzheimer's disease? Well, Dr. Alois Alzheimer was a German neurologist, and he did describe both the first patient and the pathology that we use to this day to diagnose the disease after the person has died. Uh, Dr. Alzheimer's uh, first case was a, uh, a woman who was relatively young, and as a consequence, his name was attached originally to what was called pre-senile dementia, or dementia that took its onset before age 65. We now recognize that uh, the form of the disease that occurs later in life and the one that occurs early shares the same pathology, and Alzheimer's name is applied to both. And you mentioned early, younger people can get it. There have been cases described as young as their 20s. Um, these, fortunately, as, as Peter mentioned earlier, are rare. They're due to genetic mutations that occur in less than 2% of all Alzheimer's disease. Uh, nevertheless, it's a very virulent form of the disease, and certainly when it occurs at that very young age, um, it shortens the life expectancy considerably. Yeah, most people didn't consider Alzheimer's disease in, in somebody who would, let's say, 70 or 75. The, the word senility, organic brain syndrome, hardening of the arteries of the brain, those are the terms that we used 10, 15 years ago in, in the older age group. How do you diagnose it? What are, the, what are the symptoms or the signs for the person out there who may be worried about a family member who's maybe forgetting things a little too frequently? Alzheimer's is called an amnestic dementia, and that's because in the majority of cases, the first symptom is forgetfulness. It's a particular kind of forgetfulness. It's very, very rapid, such that something that a person has heard may be forgotten within a few seconds or a few minutes. That leads to repetitiveness in conversation and a tendency to uh, forget day-to-day -day types of activities. You're There's other much short-term memory there. It is short-term to uh, in the initial stages to a greater degree than remote or autobiographic memory. But as the disease progresses, most domains of memory become involved. The initial symptoms, though, tend to be confined to the recently learned things. But not only memory is affected, and uh, I think that one very characteristic feature of the disease is a loss of insight, uh, whereas the person with a stroke or with another form of uh, brain disease might recognize that they're having a problem. The typical patient with Alzheimer's disease doesn't know and will not recognize that they are becoming ill and generally have to be brought to medical attention as a consequence. Any other symptoms that people should look for? Um, I, I think it's important to remember that we all are forgetful. You know, I'm notorious for losing my car keys and my coffee cup and my glasses. Um, that's not the kind of forgetfulness we're talking about. It, it's you know, asking you the same question four times in a row within a five-minute space because I simply can't remember the answer you gave me. This is much more typical uh, of the Alzheimer patient. Of course, as Norman said, the, the 
impairment of other activities is also noticeable. You know, failure to balance a checkbook when you've done this all your life. Um, forgetting important issues, things that you do every day. That, that's when you start looking for medical attention. What does the doctor look for once the once the, the signs have been recognized, are there any tests that can tell you that Alzheimer's is the right diagnosis? You know, it used to be said that Alzheimer's couldn't be diagnosed during life, but certainly in recent years that view has changed. And we now view the patterns of um, mental disturbance that occur in Alzheimer's disease as being recognizable. So actually the mainstay of diagnosis is not high technology or laboratory tests but a skilled examiner interviewing both the patient and a caregiver, uh, maybe a friend or a relative, to corroborate what history they get from the individual. Often, one of the biggest clues that there is an incipient dementia is that the patient themselves are not able to convey their own medical history. Uh, once the history has been collected, then it is a matter of performing some kind of a mental status examination. It's not always the case that a clinician has time to do a full and complete assessment of mentation, but they have to do enough to establish that the person has impairment, which as Peter points out, goes beyond day-to-day -day normal forgetfulness. Uh, once that's been established, they'll want to look for other potential contributing factors, the most common being medication-induced changes in cognition and affective changes, such as depression, which can often masquerade with symptoms of memory loss very similar to Alzheimer's, but can be distinguished by a good clinician. But there are other more dangerous factors, tumors, vascular problems also. Is, is that routinely checked? Well, it, it's checked when it's uh, deemed necessary from the standpoint of uh, the patient's presentation. But testing can be overdone, too. Uh, again, in the old days, we were taught that Dementia was a matter of diagnosis by exclusion. You would rule out everything, and what you were left with, you would consider to be Alzheimer's. Take a more direct and informed approach now, and we do the tests that are appropriate to the patient's particular presentation. If they have symptoms that are suggestive of a brain tumor, then by all means, brain imaging would be absolutely indicated. But there are some cases in which um, that type of an evaluation may not be necessary to come to a diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's. Very briefly, what are some of the potential causes of this disease? When I was uh, a medical resident, we, there was a lot of talk about aluminum. Everybody was worried about their pots and pans. Is that a possible cause? It's not you talking about <laughs> No. I, I think that's the one cause that can be excluded. Good. I mean, I think there's a lot of very good evidence that aluminum does not and cannot cause Alzheimer's disease. There probably are multiple causes of this disease. It's very difficult um, to identify any one environmental factor or any single event in the history of a patient which invariably leads to Alzheimer's disease. They, there are almost certainly multiple factors. We mentioned genetics and, and clearly the disease is inherited in a very small number of cases, probably 2%. Um, in 98% of cases, we don't know what the cause is. And as I said, there's probably multiple causes. Okay, good. Well, thank you both for sharing some very important information. Very interesting. Hopefully this provided you some useful information. I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot about this in the coming years. Thanks for joining our webcast. I'm Dr. David Marks, and I'll see you next time.